let me add a couple more realities about the changing world economy. And that will capture some of the ironies of all of this. China this last year achieved, among many other goals, the position of the largest exporter of automobiles in the world. Why? Well, the answer is Russia and Ukraine and sanctions give you an idea of how this works. Russia hit back against Europe when they were sanctioned. Oil and gas couldn't be sold uh, in Europe. The pipeline was blown up and all of that. And what the, Ru the Russians did was stop selling automobiles. And even more important, stop buying automobiles from the Europeans, which is where Russians more and more were buying their cars. Well, what did the Russians do? They cut a deal with China. We'll sell you oil and gas, which you badly need, and we will switch our people from European automobile purchase to Chinese automobile purchase. The Russian economy is big enough that these suddenly massive new purchases of automobiles from China shipped to Russia took China over its number two and number three position in world export of automobiles. China had been number three after Germany and Japan. Then it had been number two after Japan. But this last year, China became number one. And let me remind everyone, nothing exemplifies the dominant thing of modern economic development than the automobile. It is the core structure of the modern economy based on trucks and automobiles and vehicles and taxis and all the rest, auto, uh, buses and you name it. So if you're dominant in that industry, it speaks volumes. If you're the largest, it means you get to exploit what are called economies of scale. The fact that the larger the number of automobiles you produce, the more you can fine tune the manufacturer to lower the cost of each part below what it might have been if you only ordered 10 million rather than 20 million of something. The same applies when you buy inputs in huge quantities. Whatever the gains already known, gains from size of market, economies of scale, there will be more of them. And the country that will be in the best position to realize them will not be Germany and it will not be Japan who were two countries in the G7, but it will be China, which is a country in the BRICS. China's already the dominant player in the electric vehicle business. That will become more so for the same reasons. The, the irony, the miscalculation in Ukraine included not seeing the secondary effects in the auto industry and how that would rebound to Russia's advantage because they're going to get cheaper cars from China than they had to pay 
in Europe, as well as cementing an alliance, and as well as guaranteeing a market for their oil and their gas. You're just seeing a restructuring. Here's another example, either yesterday or today. Information was released. I'm going to make a complicated topic simple. And the information shows that once President Trump, back in 2017 and 18, decided he would reorient American foreign economic policy away from neoliberalism, away from globalization, and towards what ought to be called economic nationalism, because that's what it is. When he decided to do that, and he hit China with tariff war, you may remember, a trade war, you may remember, it meant that uh, goods coming from China uh, being offloaded in San Francisco or San Diego or wherever uh, they were coming in, would have to pay a hefty tariff. Now, Mr. Trump, who's not a sharpest knife in the drawer, uh, kept telling us how the Chinese were paying for this tariff. They weren't. A tariff is paid for by the importer, which would be a United States company. If you bring in Chinese motors, you pay China the price of the motor that China demands. If there's a tariff, it's paid to Washington by the importing country, uh, company, not by anybody else. Okay, so the, the study is now in. We've had nearly two administrations, uh, Mr. Trump and the first, if, if there's a second, of Mr. Biden. And what do we see? <laughs> we see that the supply chains which had gone from the United States to China, because China was providing more and more of what goes into whatever manufacturing is still done in the United States, that the Chinese cleverly did what every other country subjected to this kind of treatment has done in the past two to three centuries. The Chinese export what they need to export, whether it's a finished product or an intermediate good, to a third country that's not on the bad list in Washington. I'll pick one, Ghana, or I'll pick another one, Paraguay, or I'll pick another one, Malaysia. And then they transship they ship it to that country, offload it in the dock from one ship. That ship leaves, another ship comes in. They load the same material back on that ship, flying the flag of Malaysia, no tariff, or the flag of Ghana, no tariff, or the flag of pick whatever one you want, and the goods come to the United States, which means more interruption for the supply chain, more costs pushing up the inflation rate for the supply chain, but very little damage to China because China continues to produce what it did before, only now before shipping it to the US, they ship it to Malaysia and then transship it from Malaysia to the United States. Oldest gambit in the book. And now we know it's being used to get around. Or I mean, it is so sad. You know, if you're the third, fourth, or fifth modern empire to go down, your ability to manage it should have gotten better. It hasn't. It remains the trauma that can't be overcome that can't be faced. So you have this absurd situation that we celebrate 
3.2% and pretend that China with its 5.2% is not A, growing much faster, and B, that 5.2% is very low for China in terms of its recent history. And therefore, the likely outcome is over the next year and a half, it'll go back up. May not, but it, may, it very well may, because that's the trajectory that they've been able to sustain for all the years that the same skeptics were full of the same articles that I read in the same New York Times about, and by the way, I admit it, I wondered, maybe the Chinese are cooking the books. They're not the first country to do it, not by a long shot. Uh, and we are not in a position in this country to throw stones. But it was possible. But by now, watching what the long term is, the Chinese were smart. You need, if you're going to become the new empire, you need people that have confidence in your numbers. So in the end, you have your own reasons why you better say pretty much what you have to say. Otherwise, you fool your own people, and that's a problem. And you make the rest of the world not believe you, which is another kind of problem. And the Chinese don't have that. I mean, the Chinese don't seem to be uh, deluded uh, about that at all. Yes, no, no, they don't. And, uh, you know, in terms of a few things, I mean, I know uh, we are running out of time, so I definitely want to uh, let you go. But uh, yeah, you know, in terms of, whether we use the term empire, I mean, I wouldn't use the term empire to describe China in the modern sense. But uh, I think what you describe in terms of China's ability, you describe what China has been able to invest in. These new latest numbers show that China is growing just in, in ways that are hard to imagine in this economic environment worldwide, in these areas of high tech and clean energy. Uh, and to be able to do this, to raise standard of living in China and also to become part of this new world ecosystem of multipolarity and BRICS, et cetera, definitely puts China as a global leader, a global power uh, that uh, the United States in the West overall, but especially the United States, which seems to be dragging the West along, don't, doesn't have really any answers for other than the same tired ones that we see a lot of uh, in a lot of cases with regard to Russia. So, uh, Professor Wolf, your analysis here has been invaluable. Um, I know you have to go. So uh, do you have any other closing remarks and, uh, you know, anywhere where people can find you? Sure. Let me offer both of them. Uh, and let, let me end with a comment about China. You know, I'm an observer. I have no special um, access or, or knowledge other than what I try to accumulate over time. But I would say we are in uncharted waters. We have not had, we, and by the we, I mean we in the West. I am part of the West. Uh, my mother was German, my father French. And I'm an American, so that's as West as you can get, I assume. Um, and we, we know about the Roman Empire. We know about the Greek Empire and the Turkish Empire. But those are kind of Western empires. And we know about the British Empire. And we know about the American Empire. We, we know that there were sort of empires in Asia and so forth. And maybe even in Africa. And, and so forth, but we don't know much about it. In the modern era, Europe has been dominant, and countries of European descent, let's call it, have been dominant. And where they aren't the only group, they have decimated or ethnically cleansed whoever else was around. The Chinese, therefore, are new. China is a genuine non-Western phenomena. 
to be the most powerful, the most rapidly growing. The whole world is going to have to get used to it. And the whole world is going to know about it because modern telecommunications will let everybody know. And what that means is that the Chinese have a kind of opportunity that is remarkable. They may become the next empire. When I use images like one going down and one coming up, the Chinese may come up and become an empire different because it's in the East and yet not so different because it's following the model of a singular power as empire. But China seems unusually able and willing to work collectively with other nations, to formulate the BRICS, to have enormous equals Russia, a bigger country by geography. India, now a bigger country by population. Not by much, but an equivalent. This is setting yourself up to be part of a group in which others are powerful, very powerful. And there may be a model here of collectivity on our little planet that we have never imagined before. And that will be brought to us all by the Chinese because nobody else understood that possibility or saw that opportunity or saw the need to grab at it because the alternative is too much like uh, the war of all against all, which has been so bad a feature of the Western experience with empire. But I do think we need to understand that ours is in decline and that the fundamental issue for a declining economy always was, do you do that with style? Do you do that with the recognition that this is happening to you and coming to terms with the others, including those that are on the heady rise up? Or do you attempt to smash them down and prevent them? The little corner of the British Empire that we now call the United States was once an annoying, poor, corner of the British Empire. It decided to strike out on its own. The British left, sent over some troops, and tried to crush the operation. The British were defeated. In 1812, the British tried again, and they were defeated. They didn't try again. They wrestled in the Civil War with whether it might be clever to ally with the South rather than the North. Remember, they were the ones who bought the cotton that the slaves cultivated. But they didn't. They went with the North. And never again did they try to stop the new emerging colossus, the new emerging empire. The United States seems right now to be where the British were at the time of the American Revolution, trying to put the lid on Chinese development with the trade war and the tariff war and going after the Huawei Corporation and not letting them sell chip making machinery and all of the other things, none of which succeed. And they still haven't learned the lesson. Maybe you'd be better off coming to terms with the Chinese. They have to have their chance, just like you did, 
but that can be worked out so that we don't destroy each other in the vain effort to undo the history that is now unfolding all around us. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.